Welcome back, Contemporary Math. We are in the last section. We are going through Chapter 5 in this section. And we have one more test. So hang in there. Uh, so we are going to talk about statistics in Chapter 5. And so Chapter 5A, they try to introduce some of the fundamentals of statistics. Um, the book gives you kind of two definitions of statistics. So if I talk about statistics, first off, if you look on the courses offered, you might see the word statistics. So it can talk about the subject of, of statistics in general. So moreover, we can be talking about the subject. More specifically, statistics are, when I use the word statistics, I'm gonna typically use, use it to mean the data that we're talking about. These are the statistics, they're the numbers or pieces of information that describe or summarize something. So if I say like the average or mean height of people in this class is five foot seven or something along those lines. If I give you a number that describes this population, that is a, is, is a statistic. And so they can refer to the data or they could moreover like refer to like the whole science of collecting, organizing and interpreting it. Okay. So they want to talk a little bit about how statistics work. So they give you four definitions here. Uh, the first one says the population. We're gonna talk about a population. We're gonna talk about a sample. We're gonna talk about a population parameter and a sample statistic. And so they say a population is a statistical study in a statistical, yeah, yeah, the population in a statistical study is the complete set of people or things to be studied. So you want to study a group of people. So this population can be different. So if we want to say like you, um, all American adults or something like that, that could be our population. We wouldn't be able to probably go and talk to every single American adult that, or every adult that lives in America. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna select a su sort of subset from that. We're gonna select a sample from that. So from the sample, it's a subset of your population. That's where you're actually gonna crunch your raw data. So if I wanna find the average height of the average American, I would have to go out, I would have to go sample adult Americans. And I would find an average or mean their height the average or mean height of my sample would be one of the sample statistics. So I'm probably going out a little bit out of order here, but if I get a statistic from my sample, that would be my sample st statistic. Those are the numbers that we're actually crunching and finding. And it says, what is it? It's numbers describing characteristics of the sample found by consolidating or summarizing the raw data collected from the sample. We get the average or mean height of the people that we selected in order to talk about the average or mean height of the average American. So population parameters are specific numbers describing the characteristics of the population. So we're trying to get at our population parameter. We can't go measure every single adult in America. So we're only going to pick a small number of them and sample them and try to get something about the population. There are things that come into play with that. With that said, right, there are biases and stuff that we will talk about in just a second. So it is not just kind of a simple thing as go and do this and, and it's just gonna be perfect, right? There are things that we have to consider. Life is a little bit messy, but we will talk about it. So for each of the following cases, describe the population sample, population parameter, and sample statistic. So this says agriculture inspectors for Travis County measure the levels of residue from three common pesticides of uh, 25 years of corn from each of the 104 corn producing farms in the county. So we want to talk about population sample, population parameters, and sample statistics. So my population is what am I trying to study here? Okay, so they're studying pesticide 
levels, but there's setting pesticide levels is the description of what is on the corn. So what we are studying here is the corn. So we're talking about all the ears of corn. And we're talking about all the ears of corn in Travis County. It's an uh, agriculture inspector from Travis County. He wants to know about the ears of corn within his county. The sample. So he's not going to go pull every ear of corn that is grown in Travis County. So what he's doing is he's pulling 25 ears of corn. So that's the 25 years that he's grabbing from each farm. My in my in right there. Corn is not a word. Let's go with corn. My population parameter. So this is the thing I want to measure about my population. So what am I measuring about the uh, ears of corn in Travis County? I'm gonna bring the average. So I wanna know the pesticide that is on there. So the average level of pesticide. Residue is what they're doing, sorry. Uh, and it's the average level, but you got to be maybe a little more specific. It's the average level of pesticide residue on my population, which is all ears of corn in Travis County. So average level of pesticide residue on all corn in Travis County. And then here I want to talk about my sample statistic. So in order to figure out about the average level of pesticide residue on all the corn in Travis County, what I'm going to end up doing is taking the average level. I'm going to end up calculating the average level of pesticide residue. On, and I'm not doing all the ears of corn, I'm just doing the 25 ears of corn from each farm. <clears throat> So I think that's what, 2,600 ears? It's a lot of swapping to do probably, huh? Okay. Okay, got one more example to talk about population sample and population parameters. And then we're going to formalize what I was talking about a little bit earlier. Uh, so anthropologists determine the average brain skull, the brain size or skull size of early Neanderthals. They determine the brain size by, by studying the skull size in Europe by studying skulls found at three sites in Southern Europe. Okay. And so the population... The thing they want to study. So this is the metric. The brain size or skull size would be the metric, but the subject that they're studying is the early Neanderthals in Europe. They're trying to get at something at the early Neanderthals. Neanderthals. Okay. Think about how to spot one. Europe. <clears throat> the 
They obviously can't go study every Neanderthal that's ever lived in Europe, the skull of them. So what are they going to do? They're going to go. They're going to go to these three sites. So it's the individual skulls that they're finding at these three sites. They don't tell us how many there are here. If I want to talk about my population parameter, what they're trying to get at about the Neanderthals is their brain size. So this is going to be the average brain size. And now we need to be a little more specific. And this is the average brain size of my population. So what was my population again? It's the early Neanderthals in Europe. So is, we want the average brain size of all the uh, early Neanderthals. And the last thing, I want my sample statistic. It's going to be the average brain size or average skull size of the skulls found at the site. Okay. Okay, so the book has a little diagram for the next thing that we're about to look at. They give you five steps for statistics or basic steps in a statistical study. This is the thing that I've been talking about pretty much. Identify something about a group. You're going to identify a group. Identify the population. Let's say state the goal of your study. That is determine the population you want to study and exactly what you want to learn about the population. Something where we're going to talk about biases and things of that nature. We want to have a representative sample, something that represents our population accurately. So in reality, you will probably have some sort of bias in your study. But that is also why we do like multiple studies and things of that nature. Okay, so from the sample, we're going to crunch some numbers. Uh, collect the raw data and from the sample and summarize this data, finding the sample statistics. So we're going to crunch the number. That's going to give us the sample statistic. This would be like step three here. From the sample, sample statistic. We want to draw some sort of inference about our population. This is where we're going to come up with our population parameter. And then from that, they say something drawing. We're going to draw some sort of conclusion about our population. Okay, so <clears throat> with this said, it says state your goal of your study. With that said, uh, your goal of your study should not be to get a number, right? The numbers are what they are from the sample. 
our goal should not be to get a desired result. We let the, the numbers do the work themselves, right? If someone is coming up to you and you are a statistician and they're like, we want these numbers to show this and that, they're asking you to do something highly, highly unethical. That is when you like, you book it out of that place and you do not look, <laughs> you report that or something. I don't I'm not sure who you report it to, depending who's asking you to do it, but you definitely do not take part in that. You're going to lose a lot of respect from a lot of people doing that. <laughs> um, and so with that said, there's there's a few things. It's like there's lies, dirty lies, and then statistics, something along those lines. There's a lot of quotes about statistics. Um, <laughs> with that said, I don't think you can really, it, and this is a really sort of nuanced sort of thing, right? I don't think you can really lie with statistics. Numbers don't lie. Um, but you can really, really mislead people with statistics by only looking at certain numbers and cherry picking, right? To me, a lie is a true or false statement. A lie would be a false statement, right? You have a proposition that is verifiably false. That would be a lie. These are manipulations. They are manipulative. Don't get me wrong, right? They, you can do really horrible and mislead people in really horrible directions with statistics. But I wouldn't call them a lie. And that, that might be a really like nitpicky sort of thing. But I think it's important to acknowledge because if you understand what people are doing and how they're manipulating people, right? You can prevent them from doing it again, right? And, and, and you can prevent yourself from being manipulated as well as other people. So uh, the goal <laughs> isn't to, like, like if, if you just say statistics is a lie, then it, you just like are disinterested in even learning about statistics probably at that point, right? But if you understand that gaining more knowledge of statistics is the way that you prevent yourself from being manipulated by them, then you probably, you, you gain probably a little bit of desire to learn about what the statistics mean. Um, there's also that phrase, don't become a statistic, right? And that phrase is coming from like this definition of statistic. They don't want you to fall on a certain side of that data, but it's, it's kind of a silly phrase because either way, either, either action you choose, right? You're gonna be a statistic. Whether it happens or doesn't happen, you're gonna be part of that number. That number is still showing up. Whether you choose action or inaction, inaction is still something that can be recorded, so to speak. Okay, so those are the basic st steps of it in a statistical study. So now we're gonna look at a study and try to break it down into the five steps. So each month, the US Labor Department surveys 60,000 households to determine characteristics of the US workforce. One population parameter of interest in the US employment rate defined as the percentage of people who are unemployed among all those who are either employed or actively seeking employment. Describe how the five basic steps of a statistical study apply to this research. Okay, so step one. What is the population and what is their goal? Okay, so it's the U.S. Labor Department. They're trying to find something about the U.S. workforce. So I believe the population here is going to be our U.S. workforce. What are they trying to figure out about the U.S. workforce? They're trying to figure out the unemployment rate. So the goal is to find the unemployment rate among all Americans who are employed or seeking employment. Okay, so the step two, 
step one is to state our population and our goal. So step two is to draw a sample from that. So what is the sample here? Uh, they're not gonna go to every single American out there. So who are they going to? They're going to survey. So this is where they're choosing 60,000 households. The labor department's choosing 60,000 households to find their unemployment rate. So step three, they're going to choose, step two is they're going to choose the households. Step three, the next thing they're going to do after they choose the households is they're going to conduct a survey. And they're going to conduct a survey asking them whether they're employed or unemployed. So they're going to ask questions and find percentages of people in the sample who are unemployed. This is where we're drawing our sample statistic from our sample. Okay, step four, we're going to take the sample statistic and talk about the population parameter now. So now we want to sort of generalize this. And now when we generalize things, usually when you generalize things, that's when things go kind of awry, right? Um, they can go kind of one way or another. So this is where it may or may not be true of the larger sample, right? But if we've picked our, or it may not be true of the larger population, but if we picked our sample correctly, hopefully it will be, give us some insight into what the population is doing. But based on the sample statistic, the labor department makes estimates corresponding to the population parameters, such as in unemployment for the entire US. Okay, and step five, so we found our one statistic sort of about our population. We have our population parameter we want to talk about. And now we have the unemployment rate of the U.S. And so we want to make some sort of conclusion about this thing. And so what sort of conclusions and what can we do with this Ooh, Excuse me, information we just gathered? So the Labor Department... Uh, what does that say here? Labor Department draws conclusions based on the population parameters and other info. So we have the unemployment rate. They're gonna have it of uh, this year, right? If they do it this year, we can compare it to previous years. We can find the unemployment in previous years. We can find the unemployment this year. We can talk about jobs lost or gained if we start comparing it to other things, right? So there are comparisons that we can make. There are conclusions that we can draw about this.
Okay, so the labor department is going to draw conclusions based on population parameter and they can compare it to the previous parameters to find the jobs that we lost or gained. And so this is where you want to start comparing metrics that you're finding. Okay. And so now we're going to talk a little bit about a representative sample. So I used this word earlier. What do I mean by representative sample? It's a sample in which the relevant characteristic that you want to talk about of your sample members are generally the same as those of the population. Okay. But I want to talk about something maybe real quick. If you see sample statistics, so in general, in, in statistics, when we talk about sample statistics, we will use normal sort of alphanumeric letters that you're used to, right? X, they'll put a bar maybe over X bar, they'll do X and like S. But these are fairly common things, right? And so we use like kind of normal letters for sample statistics. Yeah, statistics. When we get to population parameters, right? We they start using kind of weird letters. They use Greek letters is what they use. So ooh, let me do them maybe in the right order. So they will use something like maybe U, mu and sigma. I think we're the correlating ones for those. No, this is just what I mean. We're talking about standard deviation. I think that's in chapter six. Not something you really need to know, but if you want to know in general, like if it's a sample statistic or population parameter, a really good way to know real quick is if it does it look like a normal alphabet or does it look like some Greek symbol. Um, so ideally, if your representative sample or if your sample is representative, this mean will be the same as this mean, right? The standard deviation over here will be the same as the standard deviation. We want them to have the same sort of metrics. That is what representative sample means. If it's not representative, guess what that means? It means you have a bias in your study. Okay. So we want to talk about a few sampling methods. Okay, so they talk about what four different sampling methods, simple random sampling, systematic sampling, convenient sampling, and stratified sampling. So sim simple random sampling is we choose a sample of items in a way that every sample of the sample size has an equal chance of being selected. So there are a few ways to do this. There are random number generators maybe that you could do here. Uh, you could shuffle things, right? And then we have to ask the qu question, is anything really random? But. <laughs> If you talk about a random number generator, there's an algorithm for reducing that. So it's not really random, but it works for the for the means of doing things equally probable. It works for that. So. Um, so this we would have some sort of method by which we could randomize things. We will give a few more examples in a second. And we will compare and contrast these sort of four things. So I'm just sort of laying out the definition of what they are here. So systematic sampling is we use a really simple system. You're like doing every fifth person or every tenth person. So if we're talking, if we were in class, I would count out one, two, three, four, five, and then ask them their opinion or something, right? And so it's a simple system. Every tenth customer every 50th, something along those lines. You could look in the phone book, <laughs> pull out every 10th. Uh, convenient sampling. So if I wanted to talk about the ACC population, convenient sampling would be like me 
just asking the people there in the class when I want to talk to talk about all the people within ACC. I just go and talk about the people that are in my class. It's the simplest way. It's just like what is close, what is convenient to you. Uh, stratified sampling is there is some sort of method. Um, this one, we're, the, the keyword here is that there's some sort of stratification. So if you know what stratification means, that's kind of a weird word. It's used quite a bit in social sciences sometimes. They will say something about social stratification, and that's basically the class structure that you're talking about. So stratified means like you're sorting something um, or something is being sorted. So we have some kind of sorting, some kind of grouping here. That's what stratification means. And so if we have some kind of grouping sampling is what this is, you could think. We use a method when we are concerned about differences among subgroups or strata within the population. Uh, we first identify the subgroups and then we draw a simple random sample from within each subgroup. So this it's a bit more complicated than probably these, right? We're gonna do, we're gonna draw sort of subgroups, and then once we have the groups, we are gonna result back to this thing called simple random sampling. We're gonna have like some kind of random number generator, a random number table that we just pull things from. We're gonna randomize things in some kind of way. Uh, the total sample consists of all samples from the individual groups. So we have our individual group samples. And typically you draw equal numbers from each group. Or you try to keep it representative in some sort of way. Uh, and we put all the samples together, we have the total sample. So we have a few examples that try to identify the type of sampling. Uh, so identify the type of sampling in each following cases and comment on whether the sample is likely to be representative of the population. So you are conducting a survey of students in a dorm. You choose your sample by knocking on every door of every 10th room. So the keywords I see here is something that says like every 10th, right? That is telling me it's a simple system. I have a simple system. That's the thing we call them. And I'm pretty sure I said it, but like a lot of calls and statistics, there's not like a definitive yes or no objective sort of answer for, for some of these things, right? It's sort of, are we doing sort of hand grenades or are we doing heart surgery? How much accuracy do you need? Do you need like 80% accuracy or do you need the 99.9% .9 accuracy? And so there's a lot of sort of judgment calls that kind of happen within statistics sometimes. And this might be sort of one of those things, right? How, how representative do you think this is of the population? So if we not go knock on every, what, 10th room? Eh, I would probably say, you know, that's probably fairly accurate. It depends how they assign their rooms, right? There's a lot of things that could come into play here. And this is what I really want you to start thinking about, right? I. I can only test you on so much, right? There's there's a lot of things that I'm hoping are going through your brain and that you're getting your money's worth out of the class, so to speak, right? And so I want you to start thinking about these sorts of things. Where can these things go awry, right? Be, be critical of like what is happening here. How are they assigning rooms? Are they assigning them alphabetically? Is there some sort of bias there that's happening? Don't know, but I would say fairly accurate, right? Or fairly representative, I guess I should say. Uh, to survey opinions on a possible property tax increase, a research firm randomly draws the address of 150 homeowners from a public list of all homeowners. And so if they're randomly sampling 150 homeowners. So this has a simple random sampling in it. 
next question I guess you might want to ask yourself is are we stratifying anything? So it looks like they want to talk about property tax increase. And so they're going to go to homeowners. Are they stratifying with property tax with the homeowners? It doesn't look like anything is being subdivided here. We're just talking about property taxes on homes. They're not talking about different price homes or anything like that, right? We could stratify things, but they didn't do it, right? So. Full random sampling. You would probably expect it to be fairly accurate. Just they're not. They're not really uh, doing anything I could see that might bias it in one way. Although you might get a fairly accurate, more accurate representation if you do pick strata here, right? Versus uh, doing different, uh, I wanna say price indices, indices on your home, you'd probably get more accurate. People higher up are probably getting different taxes as increase than people lower down. Tax rates aren't increasing for everyone the same, right? All right, so agriculture inspectors for Travis County measure. Oh, this looks like a familiar example. This is the one we had before. So they're measuring common pesticide on 25 years of corn from 104 corn producing farms in the county. So like we said, our population is Travis County ears of corn. The sample is uh, what is that 25 by 104 is what is that 60,000? That was that 2600. Sorry, I don't know, I'm doing my brain. 2600. Is the total sample. But then I want to talk about this 25 years of corn from each of the corn producing farms. So this one might be a little weird. They are randomly selecting these 25 ears of corn from each of the farm. They're going to each of these 104 different farms. And so it's kind of like they're sorting the corn in Travis County, right? They're sorting it into the farm that is producing it. And so if they're sorting it out into this sort of fashion, this is stratified. So this would be stratified sampling. And you want to think about how accurate this might be. Well, if they're randomly selecting 25 years of corn from the 104 different farms and they're stratifying it, this should produce probably a pretty good representation, right? And in general, I would say that these probably have stronger, right? These would probably be stronger representations than maybe this one. Just depending because we don't know how they're sorting the rooms up here. Uh, we also don't know what question they're asking. So it's a bit of a vague question. We're just knocking on every 10th room to conduct a survey. Depending what dorm you go to, what room you go to. Sometimes people, <laughs> people of a feather flock together, right? Sometimes. So sometimes you get dorm shifts depending on social dynamics and stuff of that nature could be influencing your study. So there's a lot of things that could maybe be influencing it with this system, right? Here, when we do random stuff, I feel like that would probably give us a little bit more of an accurate representation. It makes me feel a little bit safer when it's random. And then this last one says, anthropologists determine the average brain school size of early Neanderthals in Europe. So this one should look familiar too. Found at three sites. Okay. So they have three sites that they're studying. There could be other sites out there that they could go to. They may not be 
within their reach legally, right? So they might have legal barriers, maybe they're something along that lines. But this one is trying to indicate that it's really easy for them to get these skulls at the site. And so this was the example that is supposed to be convenient sampling. How accurate is this? This is probably gonna be less accurate than all those other ones. It's just like, but it is what they have, right? It is what's there. And when it matters like this, it's very hard to find Neanderthal skulls. So sometimes convenient sampling is sort of the best option that you have. There's no way to randomize these things, right? We only have a few, few select number of skulls to look at. Um, And so now we're going to talk about watching out for biases. So biases can occur when you select your sample. So statistical study suffers from bias if its design or conduct tends to favor certain results. And they talk about two types of basic uh, statistical studies. They're going to kind of they're, we're going to sort them into observational studies and experiments. So in an observational study. Key word here is that you're observing. You're not influencing anything. There's no variable and constant here, right? So when we do experiments, we like to have variables. We like to have constants. We like to rule things out, so to speak. Observational is something happened. We look at it and we take numbers about it. So in an observational study, researchers observe and measure characteristics of the sample members, but do not attempt to influence or modify their characteristics. In an experiment, we have a control and we have a variable, right? So researchers apply treatment to some or all the members and observe the effects of the treatment. With this said, <laughs> there are some sometimes these experiments in general are better, right? T typically, because we can roll out certain variables, we can compare and contrast results with or without certain variables in there. With that said, it's not always uh, an ethical thing to conduct an experiment, right? Not all experiments are ethical. If you wanted to conduct, you know, something about smoking and lung cancer, you wouldn't force people to smoke, right? You would look at the people that smoked, that would be like an observational study. So there's no ethical way to do certain things. And so observational studies are sometimes the best sort of thing that we have to do. And in general, like, and if we're talking about natural events that we can't replicate, right? Like earthquakes or something, if we want to measure earthquakes, something about earthquakes and their destructivity, that would be like an observational study. So there's no way to do like an experiment on something like that. And if they did find it out, there's no ethical way to do that experiment. We're just going to induce an earthquake. No, no, let's not do that. Oh, okay. So when you have an experiment, there is a treatment and there is a control group. There is a group that gets the treatment. Well, even in observational studies, these are both of them. There is a group that is going to get the treatment. When you do observational studies, these things kind of sort them things out, themselves out by coincidence. When you do an experiment, you have a little more control over them, right? But the treatment group is the group that gets the treatment. It's the sample that receives it. The control group is the one that did not receive the treatment. And it's really important to do this because there's this thing called the placebo effect. Um, what does it say? It's important for the treatment and control group to be selected randomly and to be alike in all res respects except for the treatment. So this again, when we have an experiment, we have more control over doing this, right? When we have an observational study, we're just looking at things. We can't really control things quite as much. Uh, but the placebo, what does a placebo mean? This is why you want to control. So if you tell someone, this is sort of like when you're treating or testing uh, medicine, if you tell someone that they're going to get better, just by telling someone they, they're going to get better, you will see them improve sometimes. So it is like we are crazy human beings, and just by believing in certain things, we can make them sort of manifest, right? Um And so we want to talk about placebos and blinding. We want to figure out whether something is or is not a placebic effect, right? Um, 
So what is a placebo? If we are testing medicine, it is like they will give you a sugar pill, right? Is what they call it. It's, it's a pill without the in active ingredient in it. It maybe has a little bit of sugar. Feels like a normal pill. The person taking it thinks it's a normal pill, which means it's single blind. If the person giving it to them doesn't know whether it's a sugar pill or a real, or a real treatment, then it would be a double blind, which we'll talk about in a second. So I'll go a little bit more into that. But a placebo is something that lacks the active ingredients, right? It's like the sugar pill. And it lacks the active ingredient of that's being tested in the study. But it looks and feels identical to it. Uh, and you're not able to distinguish it from the real deal. The placebo effect refers to the situation in which you improve just because you were taking a placebo. They believed you were going to, you believe you're going to improve, and so you improve. And so we need to distinguish the effect of medicine from placebo effects. So there are a few things I can think of, like all the vitamin C hype, right? That's been going around. There's absolutely no evidence that vitamin C actually helps you um, against the cold at all. But people can suffer from a sort of placebo effect from that, right? And because they believe it works, they can convince themselves it does work sometimes as well. That's a little bit of a different factor. But we want to be able to distinguish it. So you have some people that take it. You have some people that don't. And if it works, it should have results that are go beyond what the placebo does, right? Now we want to talk about blinding. So this is like if you're getting a placebo, if the person conducting the experiment does, oh, sorry, no. If the person that is taking the medicine doesn't know whether they're taking medicine or placebo, because if you tell them it's a placebo, <laughs> they're not gonna have the placebo effect, right? You've run the effect. So you don't tell the person that's taking it whether they or not they're taking a placebo or whether or not they're taking active medicine. So that would be single blind. So the part was to say, the participants don't know whether they are members of the treatment or control group, but the experimenters do. So if only the person taking it doesn't know, then it's single blind. If both of them don't know, so now your experimenter doesn't know, there's some sort of code you use to you randomize the pills. And then you gave the pills maybe to someone else without telling them which one is placebo, which one's real, with some sort of random code. We can do things like this to separate our personal influences from the experiment, right? And part of this is because <laughs> if the person giving them the pill knows which one is the pill and which one's the placebo, a lot of language is not, uh, what do I want to say? A lot of the language that we have is, is not verbal, right? And so we, we, you can actually give away through your body language, through other things, uh, which one's the pill and which one's the placebo, and you can run this sort of effect. So we want to see the placebo effect. And if someone knows which one's the placebo and which one's the real deal, then it runs the placebo effect, right? Placebo effect is when you convince yourself something's going to happen, so it happens. Okay. And so, with case studies, they talk about this thing called a case control study or a retrospective study. So, this is an observational study. And this is an observational study that kind of just like sorts itself out really nicely, right? It really kind of resembles an experiment. There was a control group. There was a variable group, right? There was a treatment and a control group. So it naturally sort of does that. So a case control study or retrospective study is an observational study that resembles an experiment because the sample naturally divides into two or more groups. The participants who engage in the behavior under the study form the cases, which makes them like the treatment group and the participants who do not 
engage uh, in the behavior are the controls that makes them like the control group. So for each of the experiments described below, identify any problems, explain how the problems could have been avoided. So we have a chiropractor that's performing adjustments on 25 patients with back pain. Afterward, 18 of the patients say they feel better. He concludes that the adjustments are effective treatments. Okay. So you wanna conduct this experiment. And I think he's doing good by selecting 25 of his patients. You know, he's finding out 18 of them feel better. He's asking if they feel better. But like, where is this really shortcoming? And this is, goes back to the placebo effect in single blind. Is there some sort of way he could maybe improve this uh, to verify? Because out of these 18 that say they feel better, they just got their back popped by the chiropractor. And so this chiropractor sitting there telling them, here's an adjustment that's going to help you. And so after they get done, they feel like the adjustment did help them. So the, these people could be suffering from the placebo effect, right? So we have to differentiate whether they are suffering from a placebo effect or whether are, there are verifiably more people right, that are actually feeling better from doing the actual popping or adjustment. Um, so you want to do something, and he's only got a treatment group, right? He wants to set up a placebo group. So I would say something about placebo group. Or control group, right? What does that mean? What, how would you do that? Well, he's a chiropractor, he's popping backs. He can tell people he's making the adjustment and he can make a phony sort of adjustment, right? He can, he can fake the adjustment. And what he would be looking at is that there was a higher number of people that had the adjustment that said it did better than there were of the people that had the fake adjustment and said it did better. If those two things are matching up, then what that's telling me is that this adjustment is no better than just a placebo. And so basically the adjustment is not effective. The thing that was effective was telling people you were making the adjustment, not the actual adjustment itself, right? <laughs> people were just convincing themselves they were getting better. They weren't actually getting better. Okay. So a new drug for a type of a ADD that is supposed to make the affected child less disruptive. Randomly selected children suffering from disorders are divided into treatment and control groups. Those in the control group receive a placebo that looks just like the real drug. The experiment is single blind experimenters interview the children one-on-one -on -one to decide whether they become more polite. So a lot of this gets at why we want to do, and the keyword here is this is single blind, how we can make it better. We could do a double blind, right? And this example kind of highlights why we want to do a double blind, because if you don't do a double blind, your experimenter is biased, right? Experimenter bias. And this, 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 this study is really set up like to be wrought with bias, right? They're like, not only does the experimenter know which one is the placebo and which one is the real drug, and they could kind of maybe subconsciously indicate that, not intentionally necessarily, but maybe they're like subconsciously indicating it to the child somehow. That is something that is completely possible. The other part of this is one on one with the child, right? To do whether they are polite. What the heck does polite mean? That is really like a sort of objective sort of thing. Polite is a very, very sort of, a, uh, not objective, that is a very subjective word, right? What is polite to one person may not be polite to another and so on. And also if they know which one took the drug and which one did not, the experimenter might be biased 
into believing the medicine works or doesn't work, they might be more biased into saying they are more polite or less polite. This is not a objective sort of metric here, right? This is a very, very objective sort of term. And when you're talking about objective sort of terms, you're gonna have a lot of experiment or bias there. Whether they take the medicine or not may influence whether the experimenter thinks they're being polite. Okay. Okay, so we're talking about for each of the following questions, what type of statistical study is most likely to lead to an answer and why? Okay, so we talked about observationals, we talked about case studies, we talked about experiments, and we talked about single blind and double blind experiments. sort of two groups that we're sorting up to observational and experiment and this is the single double blind we're more specific with what type of experiment we can talk about single blind or double blind and if we want to talk about more types of observational studies there's a specific type of observational study we talked about called called a case study So I think we've got one, two, three, four, five different options of what we put in these things. Okay, so for each of the following questions, what type of statistical study is most likely to lead to an answer and why? So what is the average income of stockbrokers? So is this something you're going to have to ask yourself? Is this observational or experimental? Are we going to be able to conduct an experiment? Uh, and I don't see an experiment happening here. There's no sort of control and variable happening that I can throw into here and make it in, into an experiment. This is definitely an observational. You're gonna observe the average income of stockbrokers. The other thing, is this a case study? Is it sorting itself into a case naturally? Are we getting different cases? I'm not seeing different cases in here. So I think this is just going to be observational. Do seat belts save lives? Okay. If you want to do this with an experiment, we're probably going to commit you to some kind of something. I don't know. Some, so you can't do harm to people. I don't think we're going to strap people into seat belts and see whether their lives get saved, right? That's not something you really do. Not morally. So, uh, seat belts save lives. This is going to definitely be an observational study. And back here, we when we talk about average income, we weren't going to look at people that had income and people that didn't have income, right? Something weird like that. I don't know. But here, when we talk about seat belts, and we talk about whether seat belts save lives, we want a control and we want a variable group, right? Our control group would be the people that didn't wear their seat belt. Our variable group would be the people that did wear their seat belt. So this thing kind of sorts itself into a case study if we think about wearing a seat belt versus not wearing a seat belt. So we get that control variable sort of thing happening here with seat belt and no seat belt. Here we don't get that sort of control happening, right? Uh, we're just observing their income. So that is the key sort of difference between those two. Can lifting weights improve runner's time in a 10 kilometer race? And can a new herbal remedy reduce the severity of colds? So can lifting weights improve runner's 
times in a 10 kilometer race. Is this something you can do with an experiment or is it something we're gonna have to do with an observational study? You could do this with an observational study, but when you can do something with an experiment, can we make people lift weights and then see if it improves their runtime? That seems like an ethical thing to do. So I think we can do this with an experiment. And if we can do it with an experiment, that's preferable because we can isolate variables. And then I guess the other question we have to ask is, is can we do this single blind? Can we do this double blind? Can you make someone lift weights without making them realize they're lifting weights? If you can do that, I don't know. You um, probably don't need to be taking this class. You probably just need to be hypnotizing people out there or something, I don't know. <laughs> if you can do that without making them realize it, then you're doing better than I am in life probably, right? So go for it. Uh, but I don't think you're gonna be able to do that. So can lifting weights improve runners times in a 10 kilometer race? So that's definitely an experiment. They're definitely gonna know they're lifting weights. The person telling them to lift weights is gonna definitely know they're lifting weights. I guess maybe if you gave them dummy weights that were filled with air, but that's pretty, pretty recognizable pretty fast. Uh, so I think in general that we're just gonna do this with an experiment. Can a new herbal remedy reduce the severity of colds? So now this is testing medicine. Uh, and we're assuming it's like an herbal sort of thing. It's gonna be something that's been around for a while. It's relatively safe. We're not doing anything unethical by assigning it to people to take. And so for doing this, this is definitely something we can do with an experiment or testing medicine. If we test medicine, can we do that single or double blind? We're definitely going to wanna up it up and do it double blind experiment. Okay. And so, like I said, a lot, a lot of things in statistics, this is a new sort of topic here. A lot of things in statistics are sort of a uh, judgment call. And we have sort of things like margins of error, right? Um, and so depending on, you know, how accurate you need, maybe you need to get a bigger sample to get things more accurate or more representative of your population. So whether you're doing like, you know, like I say, like I say, hand, hand grenades and hearts or heart surgery, you know, it really depends upon how many you need to get. Getting more samples usually means it costs you more money, right? Somehow, it's usually gonna cost you more money to get a larger sample. It's gonna require you to do more work. So how big of a sample we need for how big, how accurate we need is a question that comes up quite a bit. And we can figure those sorts of things out within higher statistics. But if we wanna talk about a margin of error, so that's like, we have a number and it's plus the margin of error minus the margin of error. It's basically what we're doing. We have a statistics minus the margin of error, some sample statistic plus the margin of error. So it describes a confidence interval that is likely to contain the true population parameter. We find this interval by subtracting and adding the margin of error from a st sample statistic obtained in the study. So we do our study, depending on what our population is, the larger your population, typically the smaller your margin of error, right? But the smaller your population, typically the larger your error, error is going to be. So unless total, otherwise we assume the margin of error is a 95% confidence interval. Uh, in general, that's typically what they go for. If you do higher statistics, they just tell you to do everything at 95% confidence interval. If you need to do it higher, you can do it at higher. It's easy to adjust your experiment. Slight tweak of the numbers and it's there. But we're going to do this margin of error and hopefully do it in a fairly simple sort of way to get at what a margin of error is. I'm not trying to make it super complicated, but you do have to know what you're doing. So an election eve poll finds that 52% of surveyed voters plan to vote for Smith and she needs a majority more than 50% to win without a runoff. The margin of error is 3%. Will she win? So if I want to know my margin of error, 
or if I want to know my confidence interval, So my confidence interval is between 52 points, and we want to minus three from it. And we want to do 52, and we want to add three. What is this going to be? 49% to 55%. So we are 95% confident that she will score between 49 and 55. Will she win? Will she win without a runoff is what the question probably should say. But is she guaranteed to win from this? So she needs more than 50%. Can we guarantee that she will score more than 50? So 50 is within this range, but can we guarantee that she will score more, more than 49? So 49 is an, a number that we can pick. We could pick 49.5. That's a number in there. So this And do us a two different numbers. I want to make sure that it's more than 50. This is what she needs to win. But if I look in here, this is the set of things that it could be. This is my 95% confidence. And so if you notice, anything within here is not going to be an instant win. So this does not give us enough information to conclude that she is winning, right? There will be a runoff is what this is saying. Or there is a good possibility there will be a runoff. We don't know whether there will be or not. But based on the study we do, we did, a runoff is in the possibilities, right? It is possible that she will not win it. It is possible that she will win it. But based on our study, it is also possible she will not. So will she win? It's not guaranteed, right? We cannot say that she will win. Is the important thing to take away from this. Okay, that is the last one on this one. Stay tuned for 5B coming up soon. We will talk about whether to believe in a statistical study is the next thing we're going to talk about. All right, see y'all soon.